Good morning, Cedar Ridge. I want to try something with you guys before we get started, and I want to slow down enough to just recognize how good that Esther series was. Yeah, that was some good stuff. If uh, just for the stage of life that we are in and for such a time as this that was the refrain in Esther when we feel like God's hand isn't moving or that he's nowhere to be found when all actuality he is, and we can be reassured that he's in control. What I want to try is, for those of you online, if you enjoyed uh, that series, if you want to click on one of the icons around you, one of the heart emojis or smiley faces or thumbs up, we would love to hear how you enjoyed that series. And for those of you on site, uh, this might feel kind of weird, but if you want to do the same thing and give like an actual thumbs up or, uh, you know, poetry style, some, some, cla- uh, some snaps or even some uh, good old-fashioned round of applause would be, would be totally fine with that. Yeah. And I can say that because I wasn't the one preaching it. So it's not like you guys are clapping for me. So, um, all right, let's dive into today. If you grew up in the 90s as a Christian, if you lived through the 90s, probably some of the Christian music you listened to were from groups like DC Talk or Audio Adrenaline. One of the more famous Audio Adrenaline songs is Big Big House, right? And believe it or not, we can get some pretty good theology from it, and here's why. Now, I can't speak into the big, big tables with lots and lots of food. I can't speak into the big, big yards where we can play football. Now you all have the song going through your head, right? But where they get it from is big, big house with lots and lots of room. They get that from John 14, 2, where it says, In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you because I'm going there to prepare a place for you. Some of you might have grown up on the King James Version, which translates that word rooms into mansions. And I don't know if that really does it justice because the word there used for rooms is the word monet. And it means, it's only used twice in the New Testament, here as rooms, and later on in 1423, uh, it's, it's translated as the word home. So which is it? Do we get a house or do we get rooms? What do we get what I want you guys to understand is this verse shouldn't paint a picture for us that we are going to be living in heavenly palaces or mansions or castles up in the sky, much like the King James might imply. But instead, it should in fact paint for us a picture that God's house is a heavenly dwelling in which he lives and that there's room for us. It should better be translated as dwelling places or a place to stay, a place to abide with him. Now, I want you to hold that thought because we'll come back to it later, but I want to kind of set the stage for where we're at today. Greg kind of let us know that we are jumping back into the Gospel of John, the series that we call That You May Believe. If you remember, it's the whole reason why John wrote his Gospel account, so that people would believe in Jesus. We started going through this book back in January. Like, let's just call that PC, not for politically correct but pre-COVID, right? Like, do you guys remember that window of time? Like, it feels like it was so far back, like so long ago. And in January, we went through chapters one through six, and in June, we jumped back into it, and we looked at chapter seven through 13. And now we're diving back into this Gospel of John, where we'll look at chapters 14 through the end of the book to chapter 21 over the next seven weeks. But before we get there, let me just preface with what the next three weeks are look like, because the next three weeks, we're going to cluster chapter 14, chapter 15, and chapter 16 together, because they all have a similar vein, a similar line of thinking, a similar flow, and honestly, the next three weeks have kind of alliterated themselves, because what we're going to focus on today is the path to God in chapter 14. Next week, chapter 15, it's going to focus on the place of God. It's the famous chapter that has a lot of the abide or remain in me talk. And chapters 14, 15, and 16 all have a collective flow and language about the power of God, which is Jesus talking about him sending us a guide, him sending us a counselor, as we know as the Holy Spirit. So let's pick up where we left off. If you have your Bibles, open up to John 14. If you have an app, go ahead and get there now. And as you're getting there, let me just remind you of where we were, okay? John 13, Jesus has just washed his disciples' feet. He is making his way toward the cross. We are within the last week of Jesus' life. As a matter of fact, John 13, 1 said, The time had come for Jesus to leave this world and go to the Father. 
So he's trying to set them up on what life is going to look like after he leaves. He's trying to set them up for success. And what I want you guys to know before I start reading the passages is this is a huge paradigm shift that is about to take place, both in the life of the disciples and in our lives as well. He's not trying to tell them to upgrade operating systems, and he's not saying, go, let's go from Windows 8 to Windows 10. No, he's not saying, let's go from uh, Leopard to Snow Leopard to Sierra. No, no, no. He's wanting them to make a complete shift. He's saying, let's go from Windows to Mac. <laughs> let's go from Android to Apple. Like, that is the shift that is about to take place. So let's dive in. Chapter 14, we're going to start in verses 1 through 7. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you, to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way and the place where I am going. Thomas answered him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. You see, this chapter is filled with promises to the faith community. And what I see is three general topics kind of rise to the surface here in this first half of 14. You have the departure of Jesus. You have the identity of Jesus. And in this next section in 14, you'll see the return of Jesus. These are the three things that we're going to talk about this morning, so let's dive in with the first one, the departure of Jesus. This is the first time in the Gospels that he is referencing in detail concerning what it's going to look like after he leaves, concerning what the church is going to experience after his departure. But it's not just any kind of generic description of his departure. Jesus is actually comforting his disciples He's letting them know that he's not just leaving them to fend for themselves, but instead he's leaving them so that he can go and prepare a place for them. Notice how he starts this whole thing off. He says, do not let your hearts be troubled. Jesus' farewell formula is to comfort his disciples in light of this impending departure. He's saying, not only am I going to go prepare a place for you, but I'm also going to send you the Spirit, and that's what's going to help you flourish as my followers. There's no need to have troubled hearts because he is in control, much like we learned in the book of Esther. Jesus' departure for us as Christians is important because not only is he giving his disciples something to look forward to and something to long for and a hope that is to come, but he's saying, I'm getting a place ready and I'm sending my spirit This discussion that Jesus is having with his disciples is continually moved throughout this dialogue by people asking questions. If you look back in chapter 13, Peter asked one of the first questions, and here in verse 5 of chapter 14, Thomas asked another question. He says, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? And poor Thomas, man, you got to feel bad for the dude. Like, he's already got a bad rap in church history, right? He's known as Doubting Thomas. And I just kind of picture him here in the back of the room, like he's just wanting a little bit more clarification, and he's raising his hand, and he's like, "Uh, Jesus, actually, we don't know the way. We don't know this destination. We don't know where you're going, so could you please explain it to us? Can you please show us how to get there? And I think that makes us, needs to make us wrestle or ask a few questions, Because if heaven is the destination, if heaven is Jesus' mandate, then we need to ask ourselves, then who is Jesus? What is the nature of his divine power and influence? To what degree is God himself present in him? And here is Jesus' answer. In 14.6, you have the most premier expression of theology in this entire gospel. Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Three terms, three emphasis, three bold statements declaring who Jesus is. And it's in this section that we see the identity of Jesus come to the surface. It's here that we'll spend most of our time this morning because it's in this identity that it gives more clarity to the departure. It's in this identity that will give us more validity to the return of Jesus It's in this identity that Jesus reveals his divinity and the path to God. 
So remember, the next three weeks, we're focusing on the path to God, the place of God, and the power of God. So the identity of Jesus. Jesus says he's the way, the truth, and the life. Now, in our culture and in our society, when it's viewed, when that statement is made, it's often viewed as intolerant or narrow-minded. Because what we've had a tendency to do in our society is people like to illustrate all the other major worldviews and world religions as a mountain. And they say it doesn't really matter the path you take as long as you get to that Godhead, that God figure that's on top of that mountain. So you might want to make a beeline straight up the mountain to get to your God figure. Or maybe you're kind of looping and circling the mountain on your way to the top. Maybe your route is choosing switchbacks and you're going back and forth to get to that God figure at the top of the mountain. The only problem I see with the mountain illustration is that Jesus says he is the way. No other major world religion, religious figure had or has made that claim. Jesus is the way. When I illustrate this to students, I usually like to illustrate it like this. I like to have them come up with the, the, the different ways that we can get from here to Oklahoma City. So we might list off the different ways of, of jumping on a bike or running or walking, uh, maybe put on some rollerblades or rent a lime scooter. We can jump in a car. Obviously, that'd be pretty easy to get to Oklahoma City. Um, if we wanted to go through the air, maybe we could do a hot air balloon or a helicopter uh, or a plane. That route might be kind of weird just because of the quick, you know, up and down. But anyways, you get my point. There are a lot of different ways to get from here to Oklahoma City. Now, suppose you want to get from here to the moon. It's a space shuttle. It's a rocket ship. There's only one way to get to the moon. It's not intolerant. It's not narrow-minded to say that there's only one way to the moon because it's fact. You see, Jesus is the way. And in this mantra, he wipes away all the other proposed ways to get to heaven. He's saying it doesn't matter if you're just a good person or you do good works or you're performing religious ceremonies or giving costly gifts. There's one way, and that way is Jesus Christ. But if I can just be honest for a second, I think that statement in and of itself, that Jesus is the way, is a pretty loaded statement, right? And probably over the years, we haven't done a good job defining that as Christians because we have a tendency to think, say things like, well, Jesus is the way, we better do the things that he said. Or we say, well, we better read our Bible and just do the things that it said. But how far do we take that? Like, is it, is it just Jesus' teachings and the things that he said? Is it, is it how Jesus lived his life? Is it the way he got dressed? Is it the way he brushed his teeth? Is it the way he uh, put on his clothes or the mannerisms in which he talked? Like, to what extent do we follow Jesus exactly to the letter? And what I think we need to understand is that when Jesus is claiming to be the way, this path to God, he's saying that you need to follow my lead, that you need to follow where I'm going and what I want you guys to keep in mind this morning is where Jesus is going is to the cross. So if I had to summarize this morning's sermon into a statement, into a sentence, into a phrase for you guys to remember and take away, I'd say it's this. Jesus is the way. The way is the gospel. And the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Dying to self and living to Christ. Let me say that again. That Jesus is the way, and the way is the gospel, and the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, dying to self and living in Christ. Think of it this way. Jesus had just told his disciples that he's going to prepare a place for them. But how does he leave us on earth? How does he leave this place to go to that destination in order to prepare a place? He had to die. He had to sacrifice. He had to give up his life in order for this to happen. And thankfully, he didn't stay there, right? He didn't stay in the grave because the Spirit raised him from the dead, and now he's seated at the right hand of God. I think 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 5, paints a beautiful passage and almost summarizes my main statement beautifully. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 5 says this, Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. Notice the things that he's saying about the gospel. 
He's saying this is the gospel. This is the foundation in which we take our stand. This is the gospel that saves us. And if we don't stand on it, just knowing about it is in vain. So what's the gospel? He goes on to explain it in verses 3 through 5. For what I received, I pass on to you as first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared. You see, Jesus is the way, the way is the gospel, and the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. The path to God means that we die to self, that we go away. And when you think of the act of baptism, think of what that is reflecting, that we die to self, that we are buried in our own life, and we are raised to live a new life. We come back up as something different. That's what Jesus did. But because the way, the truth, and the life gets so much clout, so much attention in this passage, and rightfully so, we sometimes miss the next few verses. We sometimes miss what John says in verse seven. He says, if you really know me, you will know my father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Fun fact, did you guys know the word no, (laughs) did you guys know the word no, is mentioned 141 times in John's gospel. 141 times. To say knowing is important is probably an understatement. But each time the word know is mentioned, it usually has some kind of different meaning. Like there's different layers, different levels to the word know. There's approximately four different levels, and let me explain them to you real quick. The lowest level is simply just knowing a fact, knowing an idea about something. So you sports fans out there, it's like knowing a stat about a favorite player, okay? Um, But let's, for the sake of this morning, let's run the idea with skydiving, It's like knowing information about how to skydive. The next level is not just knowing a fact, but understanding a truth behind that fact. So knowing how to skydive and trusting that your parachute is going to work, trusting how it's going to come out of its backpack. The third level of knowing is probably the most common level. This introduces the relationship piece of knowing It's what John referenced in John 17, 3, when he says that this is eternal life, that they know you, the true God, that they have a relationship with you, the one and true God. In fact, knowing is the most intimate relationship between a man and a woman in the scriptures. In Genesis 4, when it says that Adam knew Eve, (laughs) yeah, that he knew her, okay, So this would like be putting on the parachute. This would be like being bonded to the parachute. We're standing at the edge of the plane ready to jump, but it's still not quite the same as skydiving. The fourth level of no means to have a deeper relationship with that person, a deeper communion. This is the kind of level Paul was talking about in Philippians 3.10 when he says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. You see, we can know how to skydive. We can know information about how to skydive. We can even have the parachute on and be in the plane with a bunch of other skydivers, but it's still not the same as skydiving. We have to take that last step. We have to jump. So here's what Jesus is doing. He has strapped on a parachute, and he's saying, shoots are coming for you guys as well. And when they do, I need you to strap it on and do what I'm about to do. And then he jumps. And every day we stand at the edge of that plane deciding whether or not we're going to jump. And what are we deciding when we're deciding to jump? It's this. We're deciding that Jesus is the way. And the way is the gospel. And the gospel is simply death to life. And in dying to self, that means we give ourselves over to a life of love in the Holy Spirit. And recognize the weight of what Jesus is saying here. He's saying that seeing him, knowing him is the same as seeing the Father. He was claiming to be God in this moment. That Jesus' response in 14.7 wasn't, wasn't a rebuke to his disciples. Instead, it was a promise promoting to a deeper revelation that will come if they continue in Jesus. Now, I told you guys that this whole section, this dialogue, is continually progressed by questions being asked by his disciples. So Peter asked one in 13, Thomas asked one earlier in 14, and now Philip is stepping onto the scene, and Philip asked this question in verse 8. Philip says, Lord, show us the Father, 
and that will be enough. What Jesus is about to tell Philip is something that Philip could not have comprehended before, that Philip is seeing God in Jesus. This is a high point of John's gospel because he's saying that Jesus is no longer just simply a good religious teacher, nor a guide, or a means to some other destination. He is also the end. He is the end goal. He is the one in whom God can be found. The exhaustive and exclusive nature of this astonishing claim cannot be missed. So listen to what Jesus says in verses 9 through 11. Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have been with you for such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe in me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. You see, Jesus has now disclosed more information than anyone expected. Instead of simply defining that, de that destination of where he's going to go back to the Father and to go in heaven, he says that I am the way to get there. And since only God can lead us to himself, Jesus takes the next step, a step, no doubt, that the disciples can barely comprehend. He says only the Father can lead us to himself, and the Father is genuinely present in Jesus. This is his identity. One commentary writer puts it this way, it's not simply that Jesus is sent on a divine mission on behalf of the Father, but that the Father himself is on a divine mission in the life of the Son. Hmm. Jesus is explicitly saying that the Father is living in him. Jesus Christ is God in complete human form, and so he has the capacity to accomplish these divine tasks and hence, if his followers continue in Jesus, they will know the Father as well. And this leads us to our last point, the return of Jesus. Now, I'm not going to spend much time here on this particular element today, just because a lot of this language comes later on in the chapter and on in the upcoming chapters. But remember how Greg would end some of the Esther series sermons and saying, do you want to know the end of the story and how Esther ends? We're going to have to come back next week. If you want to know about the return of Jesus, you're going to have to come back these next few weeks. But I will say this. Throughout chapter 14, Jesus continually brings comfort to his disciples by focusing on his imminent return. He says things like, I will come back in verse 3. He says things like, I will come to you in verse 18. Or we will come to him in verse 23. Are these references referencing Easter? Are they referencing the second coming? Are they referencing the coming of the Holy Spirit? And I think collectively the answer is yes. But ultimately, here's what's being summarized. That the Father is resident in the life of the Son, and the Son is sending the Spirit, and the Spirit will reside and dwell in, find its monet, its dwelling place in us. See, I told you I'd come back to that thought at the beginning. Here's how Jesus ends this particular section in 14. Verses 12 and 14, he says, Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. Now, I think when most people come across this passage or this passage catches their eyes, I think what jumps out to them is the part where it says, and you will do even greater things than these. And it makes you want to go, what? Like, what, what are you saying, God? Are you, are you saying that I'm going to perform uh, miraculous acts? Or are we going to feed 5,000? Are we going to walk on water? Are we going to raise people from the dead? And Jesus is saying, no, it's, it's not like that. It's not so much a greater in quality as it is rather a scope in quantity. Think of it this way. How did Jesus himself define greatness? He said, if you want to be great, you need to serve. He just washed his disciples' feet in 13, right? And so he's saying, if you want to be great, you need to be the least of these. If you want to be great, then you need to bring glory to God. You need to contribute to his kingdom, when Peter preached the sermon in Acts chapter 2 and 3,000 sinners were converted, 
The fact that an ordinary man performed these signs made it even more wonderful and brought great glory to God. I can even remember one Ozark professor putting it this way, that we have the chance to baptize people into the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, something that Jesus himself never did. Now, I'm not saying that to say that I don't think Jesus could have or or wouldn't have. As a matter of fact, I think he was wise in that decision-making process, probably to avoid future fights and quarrels, much like what happens in 1 Corinthians when they start arguing about who converted them, right? This way, no one could say, oh, yeah, well, Jesus baptized me, right? He's eliminating that fight. But even more than that, he knows. He knows that the Spirit is coming, and he knows that the Spirit was going to do even more amazing things through dwelling in his people. That's why it was important that Jesus go. And in the last part of John 16, if I can skip ahead to the end of John 16, Jesus has told them that it's better that he leaves that he send them the Holy Spirit to guide them, to come alongside them, and to be a counselor for them. He tells them that he's going to stop speaking in riddles and stop speaking figuratively, and he's going to tell them plainly what's going to happen. And this is what he says plainly. He says, I'm going to leave, and you're going to receive the Holy Spirit. John 16, 29 through 33 paints it this way. It says, then Jesus' disciples said, Now you are speaking clearly and without figures of speech. It's like they have their own light bulb, their aha moment. Now we can see that you know all things, that you do not even need to have anyone ask you questions. This makes us believe that you came from God. Do you now believe, Jesus replied? A time is coming, and in fact has come, when you will be scattered each to your own home. You will leave me all alone, yet I'm not alone, for my Father is with me. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace in this world. You will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Does this sound familiar? Does this sound like the start of 14 where he says, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. You see, in him we have peace. In him we have comfort. And sure, we're going to have troubles. That's a given. But take heart because he has overcome the world. You see, the cross is the path. The cross is the way. And when we give up our spirit to let the spirit of God reside in us, then we fully understand Jesus being the way, the truth, and the life. It's then that we can understand the destination and the identity and the return of Jesus. It's why it's such a paradigm shift, because it's no longer just about the temple, it's no longer just about the animal sacrifices or priests and rabbi, and it's no longer just about Jesus. Why? Because it's about the Spirit of God living in you, and you telling people about this way, about this path, about this path to God that leads us to the place of God, which we'll talk more about next week. Let's pray. God, I pray that we can focus on you being the way, that we would let that craft and mold and shape our lives and the way we live as Christians. I pray that even if we don't know that, if we don't understand that, that we would uh, let the text just speak to us and and move us and let your spirit uh, move inside us uh, to make that decision today, God. I pray that we would um, just fall more in love with you and understand you being the path. And we look forward to these upcoming weeks of understanding more about the place of God and the power of God. In your name I pray. Amen.